Welcome to KMET 1490 AM ABC News Radio and the Southern California Business Report with Yvette Walker, a show dedicated to highlighting successful Southern California businesses and the people behind them. Welcome and thank you for joining ABC News and Talk Southern California Business Report on ABC News and Talk's KMET 1490 AM, 98.1 FM, and KMET TV. I'm Yvette Walker, live blasting our signal from the center of Southern California, serving a population of over 25 million. Get us crystal clear and on demand by downloading the free live streaming app on Google Play and the Apple App Store. As always, a huge shout out to the team. Mitch, Bill, and Sean, I love you guys. And to our special advisory committee, who can be found at scbrtalk.com backslash advisory committee. Today, I have the distinct honor to introduce Dr. Anne L. Viracel, who joined the San Bernardino Symphony Orchestra in 2013, bringing over 25 years of strategic business expertise, both in the public and private sectors. With a strong desire to advance the economic su success of the Inland Empire, she enthusiastically took on the daunting task of improving the orchestra's visibility through positive public perception initiatives regarding the role of the arts and arts education in the Inland Empire. The results of those are considerable efforts include statistically significant increases in local audience diversity and engagement at all levels, a growing volunteer base, statewide notoriety, including best in industry awards, and near doubled annual budget. Not long after joining the organization, Dr. Vericell established the Classroom to Concert Hall Initiative, which provides a pathway to fine arts access to hundreds of local students and their families each season. She also doubled the number of annual student concerts and expanded the program to neighboring communities. To further support the symphony's mission for music education, Dr. Vericell is a regular career day presenter throughout the region, and she serves as a reading buddy in K-2 through classrooms and as a mom mob member regularly supporting K-6 through students throughout the San Bernardino City Unified School District. In addition to her work with the symphony, Dr. Viracell holds public office as chair of the San Bernardino Community College District Board of Trustees. She has simultaneously worked as a professor at the university for 20 years. She further serves the community as treasurer of three nonprofit organizations, the San Bernardino County Natural History Museum Association, the San Bernardino Valley Concert Association, and the San Bernardino County Arts Connection. She is also a board member at large for a number of local nonprofits, including the Unforgettables Foundation. She was recently elected as an officer of the newly formed California Community College Women's Caucus. Dr. Vericell is also an author, having published dozens of academic and industry articles, and most recently collaborating on the autobiography of educator and civil rights activist, Dr. Margaret Hill. Thank you so much for being with us today, Dr. Vericell. Thank you. Boy, I sound a lot better than I think I actually am. <laughs> well, you know, you are an incredible woman. And after reading your biography, I can't believe you're only one woman. <laughs> you must have a clone running around out there somewhere because the amount, the scope of your work is incredible. Your accomplishments speak for themselves. Um, and I'm so excited to have you today. Well, thank you. I actually know a lot of people that are a lot busier than I, than I am. And, you know, you mentioned Dr. Hill. She had a habit of showing me her uh, calendar on her phone all the time. And when I thought my calendar was busy, I would look at Miss Margaret's and it was always a lot busier than mine. <laughs> well, you know, it's what it takes to make an impact. So as you know, Dr. Verisol, the first question I ask every one of my guests is to kind of take us through and talk about what inspired them to pursue the field and the career pathway that they have selected and they're in. Well, you know, I never thought about being a nonprofit director. I'd sat on nonprofit boards for years, YMCA boards and all sorts of things like that. Um, and I, I never realized how much there was to it. It just seemed like this thing that happened naturally. As a board member, you set policy, and then you, you just watch wonderful things happen. But as a staff member, you get to be the person who makes the wonderful things happen. So I learned that very quickly. 
Um, I wasn't really looking for work in the arts either because I'm I'm a mathematician. Um, I'm really not a an arts person. I studied political science and math. Um, but the San Bernardino Symphony was very well positioned uh, 10 years ago when I started um, to make a huge difference in our community. And that I found extremely uh, attractive. So I looked at their website and noted some things that might be improved and read some of their press releases and noted some things that might be improved and reached out and said, I'd like to help you if I can. And not long after, maybe a year or so, um, I got a request to interview for the job of director as the current director was going to be moving on to a different job. And I guess it was low expectation day because they gave me the job and I have enjoyed it ever since. It's it is a lot of fun. I get to work with really interesting people, people that don't think like me at all. And I really like that. I love that. Um, <laughs> Dr. Varicel, you know, uh, we know that the San Bernardino Symphony Orchestra is one of the oldest orchestras in the state of California. Please mm -hmm. give us a little background on the orchestra. Well, it's been around since 1929. So we're we're about to go into our uh, 94th, 95th season. Pretty amazing, isn't it? It really is. Yeah, it was founded um, based on the concept of a 15-year-old named Jimmy Guthrie, James Kelly Guthrie. And he liked to play music with his friends. He lived in San Bernardino and Colton. And, and he felt that communities that had access to the arts were more livable, and more vibrant places than communities that lacked that vital access. And so he got together and formed what would eventually become the San Bernardino Symphony. It was the Inland Empire Philharmonic for a while. I like that because we are regional now. Right. And, and so we don't just draw from San Bernardino, but we did officially uh, change our name to that some years ago, San Bernardino Symphony. But it we were a um, a community symphony, and then there was a relationship built through the uh, adult school, and the symphony members came from there. Um, many years later, we became incorporated. We hired some staff. We became a professional orchestra, and by that I mean we became members of. American Federation of Musicians. So we're a union orchestra through Locals 47. And uh, we have amazing, amazing uh, players. It is an honor to, to get to go and hear them. I can only imagine, you know, I'm so excited. I've heard little things here and there, but I have not had the privilege of actually sitting in and listening to the San Bernardino Symphony Orchestra. Um, let's talk about what it is that you do at San Bernardino Symphony Orchestra and what your role includes as the executive director. It's kind of everything. And I think any nonprofit executive director will say exactly the same thing, because although you may have staff, the you know, but kind of stops on your desk. We are a corporation and there we're a nonprofit corporation. And therefore we have a board of directors and our board sets policy. They are our fiduciaries and in fact are the owners of the organization and they are our ambassadors. But we don't ask our board members to do the work. We don't say all the people sell the tickets, raise the money. Um, that is not their job. Their job is policy. So for many years, it was just one employee and me. Uh, that employee since retired. And now we have a full-time accountant who also sells tickets, who also runs our Guthrie Music Rental Library. So she also does a whole lot. Um, and we are growing our staff with... Uh, additional outreach folks and administrative folks, in addition to the um, people that we've always had um, who were contractors working for each concert. 
Um, each concert requires a musician's librarian, someone to collect the music, generally from our Guthrie Music Library, which is a gift from our founder, um, or collecting the music from elsewhere if we're going to perform something that isn't at the library. Uh, we have a personnel manager. That person reaches out to the musicians to give them their initial contracts for the year. But he also um, identifies excellent sub substitute players for to fill in where a piece of music might ask for more players than we have as our um, as our regular tenured players. So he will go and find the best. LA players and they will come down and play with us as well. Some pieces of music require 25 people. Some require 50 people. Our maestro, Anthony Parnther, likes music that requires about 100 people. <laughs> so that's going to be some extra uh, staff. And so our personnel manager goes and gets those people. We also have sound and lighting technicians who are amazing. So when we perform places like the California Theater, which you see behind me, um, you don't see the stage, but you see some people. I believe that's from the February concert. Um, but you, we have mapped out the entire stage so we know how every square foot sounds and we can properly position the risers for our people to get the utmost sound out of every concert. California Theater is a very dry house acoustically. So you have to do a bit more to make it sound the way all over the house, the way it sounds in the optimal spots. So we have technicians to do things like that. So your question was, what do I do? And then I just told you what everybody else does, right? So you're in charge of making sure everybody else does what they need to do, it sounds like. And everything is just right. With the exception of the artistic work, which is under the purview of our maestro. And he is really the uh, visionary when it comes to our overall look and branding. I love to say I came up with the beautiful things that we do, but he has got the eye and political science and math. So, you know, I, I like to raise the money and make sure that we can do the things we need to do to give the community what we need to give them and and that's a that's everybody working together but somebody's got to be blamed and that's usually the the executive director right there always has to be the person where the buck stops right where does the buck stop who's the one in charge and yeah. so that's that's you dr varicel well, um, so I, <laughs> dr varicel can you paint a picture of what the symphony orchestra looks like if we were to go in and walk and enjoy one of your performances, you know, how many uh, members would we see and what would the sections look like? Well, it is a full orchestra. Um, so you're going to see a large complement of strings players, primarily violin, just like singers um, have different parts, but the sopranos basically take the melody line. In an orchestra, the violins generally take the melody line, or at least most of it in a piece. So we've got a large group of violinists. We have violists, cellos, bass, double bass, huge bass, double bass. Um, and then we also have a woodwind section with clarinets and oboes and such. Um, we have brass with um, amazing tuba player um, and horns. We have wonderful horn players and um, goodness, flutes and piccolos and such. And then we have um, the percussion section, which is one of my favorites because they get to play the giant timpani you know that song from Oklahoma where they're talking about a copper bottom timpani? You may not. You're not old. but <laughs> I, You know what? I've seen Oklahoma, but I don't yeah. recall that score. Right, right. It's just a silly, it's a silly song from that. Um, but I always wondered, what does a copper bottom timpani look like? It looks like a big, giant drum's head over the top of a big piece of uh, pounded copper. And it makes the most beautiful sound. So it, sometimes we have xylophones, 
Um, we have, you know, various drums. Depending on the music we're playing, we might even have a traditional drum kit in there where somebody is playing the drums like you would see in a band based on the music that's needed. We bring in players to play instruments that are needed in a score. So as I said before, sometimes you need 25, sometimes you need 50, sometimes you need 100, depending on how the composer scored it. But sometimes you also need some crazy things. Uh, Ferdy Grofe's um, Grand Canyon Suite has a, a movement in it where you need to hear the sound of the wind. It enhances the music. Um, Pines of Rome, you need to hear the birds. And so we have folks in the percussion section that perform those instruments. So you hear the birds and you hear the wind. And when we did the Looney Tunes theme, I think that was what it was, um, we uh, also had a fellow back there breaking plates because you needed to have the breaking <laughs> plates and yelling. You, know? oh, you have to bring it all to life, right? You do. And so it. whereas, you know, often you'll hear classical or symphonic music um, in, in an elevator or someplace else that's pretty banal. Um, when you go and see it in person, it's entirely different. It's intriguing. It, it keeps your attention. Um, this last February, we had in students from several school districts. The first one was our own city of San Bernardino Unified School District. And we played Shostakovich for them. We didn't play anything else. We did not play, um, you know, uh, Peter and the Wolf. We didn't play those things that are traditional for children. We played two or three movements of a very heavy piece by Shostakovich. They sat at the end of their seats and they did not talk. And they just were enthralled with the music. First, Maestro is amazing to watch. He explains the piece so you know it's coming up and you're listening for things. That's very important. But also watching the musicians play, it's it's a lot more interesting than just listening to orchestral music uh, while you're studying or whatever in the elevator. <laughs> right, right. I can. It's, it's truly. Different. It's a feast for the senses, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're there with everybody else that is enjoying this experience. You can actually feel the waves of resonance and music, you know, hitting yes. your body. And you know, like you said, you're watching, you're feeling, you're you're everything in the air. It's just. It's remarkable. It's, and, it's um, amazing. You have made such a good point. It's a huge shared experience. So if you're looking at the people behind me, um, you've got adults, you've got kids, you've got people that are dressed up in suits. I see a gentleman in a jacket right there. I see some people in T-shirts over there. Um, everybody comes to the symphony. There, you do not have to be Thurston and Lovey Howell from <laughs> Pilligan's Island to want to go to the symphony. It's really fun. It's really interesting. And uh, Maestro selects all of the music that's part of his job as our artistic director. And he picks music that he knows our community likes. He did his homework when he came to join us. And he came in and he said, our community likes fun music. They like spectacle. They like uh, music they understand, but they also like new pieces. So he has brought in some beautiful premier pieces, uh, primarily by women composers, which is amazing because only about 2% of the music that's performed uh, by professional orchestras are written by women. So wow. we've had some beautiful pieces performed and the audience has responded beautifully to those. But we do our annual movies with a maestro night every uh, fall where people bring their lightsabers and everybody's like got their lightsaber out for uh, these when we play Star Wars. And we played, oh, one of my favorites uh, is John Williams' Jurassic Park score. It's just beautiful. And but people know this music. Right. But they they haven't seen it perform. They've heard it perform. They've heard the John Williams version, and it's beautiful. 
but they may not have been there to see it. So being there to see it is this wonderful experience of something that you know and you feel familiar with, but you're seeing it in an altogether new way. And that's really exciting part of what we do. Oh, I love it. And I also understand that, um, you know, you are going to be having the very distinct privilege and honor of hosting something very big. Please tell us about what's going to be happening with the Association of California Symphony Orchestras Conference. Well, for the very first time, the Association of California Symphony Orchestras is holding their annual conference in the Inland Empire. They have never done this before. I don't think they've been any farther south than Los Angeles. And the LA Phil is pretty hard to beat. So we were very, very honored to be selected to be the host organization. Um, And we will be uh, conducting an Inland Empire conference. It will be held at the Mission Inn in Riverside. Wow. It's a lot of fun. And it'll be in August on the 16th, 17th, and 18th. And attendees will come from all over the state, all the folks that run the orchestras. So all the executive directors, all the board members, all of the conductors and such will be there um, to talk about best practices and to learn. We have wonderful speakers coming for that every year. It's a great conference. You know, conferences are always good. And so this is going to be lovely. But the very first night of the conference is a um, a replay of our Movies with the Maestro. So we're going to be performing it the Saturday before at the California Theater, and then that Wednesday in August at the Little Coil Auditorium, small but it has beautiful sound, in Riverside. So we'll be out there. And the Riverside Phil will be uh, sending, I believe, an ensemble to perform during the, the uh, um, conference. And then the Redlands Symphony, will also uh, be participating uh, because the last night of the conference, we're going to the Redlands Bowl and uh, we're all going to get in the bus and go to the bowl and um, watch them perform, uh, hopefully with fireworks. I think it's close to the last night of the bowl season. So we're going to show the state of California that they should not overlook Little Inland Empire Because not only are we bigger than seven states, we are uh, quite vital in the arts. So we're very happy to have our partners with us in this conference. Well, that is absolutely exciting. And, you know, that just... Uh, goes along with the trend of everything that is associated with what we know as the Inland Empire, which is comprised of San Bernardino and Riverside counties. And as you so astutely noted, larger than many, you know, quite a few states in in the country. Um, Mm -hmm. And also um, just uh, winning awards after awards, you know, San Bernardino County just released uh, an update indicating that uh, the North American County Officials Association came together, you know, again, breaking records and awards for innovation and and economic growth Mm -hmm. and development and very exciting things. So this is all on trend for what many of us enjoy being in what we call the Inland Empire. And it's exciting Mm -hmm. to see that the San Bernardino Symphony Orchestra is, you know, leading the way musically, right? You're leading the charge musically, and it's just absolutely inspiring. Thank you. We have worked very hard. Um, And being an orchestra uh, in a downtown urban area where not mo- most folks are not drawn to uh, orchestral music has been a challenge. However, uh, if we are going to serve our populace, if we are going to stay sustainable, we had to change with the times and listen to what people wanted and perform that type of music in a way that resonated. You can't tell people We're playing great music and you have to come and hear it because we are going to do this for you. That's not how that works. People have a lot of choices for their entertainment and their arts experiences. And so if we weren't attractive to them, they were not going to come and see us. And if they don't come and see us, not only do we close, which is sad, that would be sad, but much sadder 
would be if they did not have that opportunity to have the experience of, of you know, being involved in, in a concert, going to a concert. It's very different. Absolutely. And, yeah. you know, we're coming up on a break, Dr. Varicel. So stick with us for another moment. All right, everybody listening. I'm Yvette Walker with ABC News and Talk, Southern California Business Report with Dr. Ann Varicel, Executive Director of San Bernardino Symphony Orchestra, one of the oldest American symphony orchestras in California, based in San Bernardino, founded in 1929 by newspaper magnate and conductor James K. Guthrie, when we return. Cal State San Bernardino is home to the only School of Entrepreneurship in California. With globally ranked degree programs, you can start your journey today to become a successful entrepreneur. Learn more and connect at entre.csusb.edu. Hi, I'm San Bernardino County Sheriff Shannon Dykus. If you're looking to start an exciting career in law enforcement and make a difference in your community, we are hiring. Dispatchers, nurses, deputies, laterals, and many more. For a complete list of our jobs and more information, visit sheriffsjobs.com. The University of Laverne is rated first in California for alumni satisfaction. Learn more about accelerated programs offered online and on campus in Laverne, Irvine, Ontario, Burbank, or College of the Canyons. Visit go.laverne.edu. The University of Laverne. Go.laverne.edu. Hi, I'm Dana Rademacher with MGR Property Management. A lot of people wonder about the value that property management has for their property. Property management can include all property types, including residential, commercial, and HOA. It is valuable because property managers are experienced in what can happen at your property. We're aware of liabilities. We're able to do predictive and preventative maintenance. We know what is coming up with the changes in the weather, the seasons, how old certain aspects or different capital projects at your property are. We're able to best negotiate contract pricing, legalities with your tenants, and anything else that you may need to ensure that you're getting the full value of the property. If you're interested in speaking with a representative at MGR Property Management regarding your property management needs, you can visit our website at mgrrealestate.com or you can call our number at area code 909-581-6600 to be connected with a representative. Hi, Ray Lance from the Diamond Center in the Claremont Village here. One of the coolest parts of a third generation family business is getting to know the families we serve through generations. Once you experience our friendly service, our fair and transparent pricing, and our beautiful jewelry that we make to last a lifetime, you'll stick with us too. Come visit us in the Claremont Village or at Lance, L-A-N-T-Z, DiamondCenter.com and see what makes us different. Ontario International Airport is on to a better way to fly with over 65 daily non-stop flights to more than 20 major destinations and the easiest airport experience in Southern California. Visit flyonto.com slash Ontario to learn more about Ontario International Airport today. Welcome back. Yvette Walker here with ABC News and Talk, Southern California Business Report with Dr. Ann Varicel, Executive Director of San Bernardino Symphony Orchestra, one of the oldest American symphony orchestras in California based in San Bernardino, founded in 1929 by newspaper magnate and conductor James K. Guthrie. Thank you again for being with us today, Dr. Varicel. Thank you. Lovely. So prior to the break, you gave us a beautiful breakdown of your background and what we can expect to experience and feel when we go and watch a performance by the San Bernardino Symphony Orchestra. And I know that in our conversations, you know, and uh, through the efforts of your conductor, you're looking at, you know, increasing that um, footprint within the community by growing initiatives focused on our youth. And mm -hmm. with that, I know you are looking at developing a youth win ensemble. Can you uh, 
talk about that, please? Yes, yes. We actually have developed a youth wind ensemble. It began in 2021, and it was the brainchild of Maestro Parther, because all good things are. And he has, I'll go back a couple of, of steps, he has commissioned the work of over 200 women, um, their, their compositions. And, and nobody does this. And he, he does this. And he had the dream of putting together a student performance group of really excellent students, not let's learn how to play this. They get that at school. In the San Bernardino City Unified School District, the students can study music from fourth grade through 12 and then go on to Cal State or whatever and study it some more. What he wanted to do was put together a group of students who were already excellent. So you would audition to be a part of it. And then they would perform the music of women and other underrepresented composers. So primarily women and people of color. And he wanted to do it by orchestra family. So within the orchestra, we talked about the different instruments. There are families of instruments, the strings and the winds and the brass and the percussion and such. And you can tell I'm not a musician. Um, but one of them is winds. And, you know, often orchestras, orchestras will start with a strings group, but we had um, the opportunity to start with a winds group. So we did that. And it was formed in 2021. Dr. Nicholas Bratcher, who is the former head of bands at Cal State San Bernardino, was our initial leader. And he and his committee, members of the um, symphony board, and from folks from local uh, school music programs and others got together and they made a, a handbook and they tied the um, performance and uh, rehearsal schedule to the school um, the school schedule. And the teachers reached out to their best students and said, we have a wind ensemble. Would you like to be a part of it? And so every Sunday afternoon, they rehearse at Valley College in San Bernardino, home of KVCR. And uh, then they, at the end of each semester, they perform. So that has been extremely well, um, well accepted by the community because the students don't just get to play music. They get to play music that's written just for their instrument family. When they study at school and perform at school, they're playing as part of a larger orchestra. That makes sense, right? Because you've got a lot of students playing a lot of instruments, and you don't want them sitting around waiting till it's their turn. You want them to learn the full orchestra experience. Our group is unique and different in that it's focused on one family of instruments at a time, and then the music that has been composed by underrepresented traditionally composers. So they get to perform that. So they're not just great players that auditioned into an outstanding group led by an outstanding conductor, and they get master classes from our own musicians from the symphony, but they're also cultural ambassadors to the community through what they play and the music that's selected. Our last um, concert for them was standing room only. There was no room for anyone. I was wow. seriously standing in the back door, kind of holding it. So <laughs> when folks were coming in and, you know, in, they would not keep opening and closing the door and, you know, in the midst of the, of the uh, performance, but it was so crowded. We brought in every chair we could into that music hall. People were standing against the wall, just listening because it's something you're not going to hear any place else. So recently our head violist, John Wang, he said, I would like to have a strings ensemble. I'd like to do the same thing. We would use the same handbook. We would use the same um, methodology with the master classes and such. And we would also be uh, dedicated to the performance of works by underrepresented composers. So now we're looking at forming a youth string ensemble as well. 
So oh, I love it. Really excited. And you know, something yeah. that really stood out to me that I just absolutely adore is when we talked about, you know, access to these opportunities for students. And the way you expressed it to me is every student that wants to join and wants to play an instrument, there's an instrument available. And mm-hmm. I think I shared with you my experience um, growing up and I was, uh, I played the clarinet for three years, but you know, the music teacher came in, held up the clarinet and said, who wants to play the clarinet? <laughs> Five people raised their hands and by the grace of God, I guess, the teacher mm-hmm. selected me. And I had the opportunity and privilege to play that clarinet for three years and join honor band. And I absolutely loved it. And I believe it was very transformative impact on my life. So knowing that San Bernardino has the resources and, um, you know, the, the opportunity to give those children, that youth, um, that experience of learning how to play and alongside an actual um, you know, orchestra is absolutely mm-hmm. phenomenal, unlike anything else. Um, so thank you so much for your efforts to continue that. Um, you. And so, you know, we're talking about these um, these youth ensembles uh, that were spearheaded by the idea of maestro Anthony Parther. Mm-hmm. So let's talk a little bit about him and his background. He's amazing. Uh, and you'll have to have him on because... Yes. He will, he will, he knows everything. I mean, I can seriously say that there is nothing about the history of music and musicians and composers of any genre that that man does not know. And he's my daughter's age and he knows, I mean, he's just amazing. What I really like about him is he does know everything and he can, he went to Yale and he can certainly, um, you know, hold that over someone, but he doesn't. He is in no way like that. He is one of the most accessible, lovely humans that I have ever met. And when he came to us as part of a two-year formal conductor search, he was the first candidate out. It was October of 2017, and he was the very first candidate. And we wanted to bring the community into our decision when we were going to hire a new conductor. So we gave them a survey. They had about five or six things that we asked them to rate each conductor on. So whether they were a season ticket holder or this was their first concert, they got a survey and many, many, many people turned them in. Well, on the first concert, everybody loved him. It was great. There were three standing ovations before the intermission. This does not happen. The, the man has a lot of charisma in addition to being an amazing conductor. He has a tremendous amount of charisma and he talks about each piece before he plays it. He doesn't even believe in pre-concert lectures. And I kind of love that because I think they're very non-inclusive. You can't take your kids to the concert, go to the lecture and then go to the concert too long of a time. Families can't do that. You have to feed the kids and then get them. there. And right. there's just a lot of reasons that it's a not particularly inclusive uh, practice. He talks about the music before it's played. So everybody gets the message, not the three, 400 people that come for the lecture, but the whole 1,730 people in the audience get the whole story and they get to share that experience at the same time. So He's just amazing, but he was the, our first candidate. And then every time we get our surveys back, they would say, "Oh yeah, this next one, they're good, but I like that first guy." Then we bring in another one, and they'd say, "Oh yeah, this one's this one's not. I don't know. Can you get that first guy?" And this happened all the way through with all ten or all the nine other candidates. And when it came to making a final decision, it was pretty clear who we needed to bring in. And we have been so excited and so blessed to have him as our conductor and music director ever since. Now, you may not have seen him yet at the California Theater. Ms. Walker, you are definitely going to uh, oh, July's concert. We'll absolutely. see him there. <laughs> yes, without a doubt. Absolutely. But I bet you've heard him already. Because if you went to see the movie... In Kanto or Avatar or Black Panther 2 uh, Wakanda Forever or oh my goodness just about anything that's come out recently he is the conductor for that movie 
That is remarkable. So, that is astounding. What right? a gem to have right here in our county representing San Bernardino Symphony Orchestra and investing into our youth and bringing them in and creating opportunities as a pathway to hopefully join the orchestra in the future. Sure, sure. I, I think that somebody with that, those kind of musical chops and then that ability and being such an outstanding communicator and so accessible, you know, um, it is, is a reason that people want to come to the concerts that, that they would maybe not have wanted to before, but they hear about the maestro and they decide they want to come. After every concert, we do a, uh, a little reception upstairs in the California room. And a lot of orchestras do receptions for their major donors or things like that. And, and, and that's lovely. And, and I'm not putting anybody down, but we do our receptions for anybody who wants to go because sometimes it's that family there for the first time that is going to have the, it's going to have the biggest impact on them versus someone that comes every single time to every concert who we love and adore and certainly appreciate, but why exclude anyone specific? So um, Maestro will, as soon as he can get through the crowd, um, be up there. He will shake hands. He will be take pictures with everybody. And he's usually the last one to leave because he wants to make sure that he's had a chance to meet everybody that wants to meet him. And I, that's another thing to adore about Anthony Parther. Oh, I love it. And you have several upcoming concerts. Please, let's talk about them. And we're, we got to run through them because you have four and I know that they're beautiful, but the first one coming up is July 1st, America, the beautiful, please give us a overview. Yes. Yes. We are going to perform that. It's our second. So no longer our inaugural. It's our second annual concert under the stars on the football field at San Bernardino Valley college. And it is just amazing. I had, I saw the pieces come together. I raised the money for it last year, but when it happened, it was far more than I personally anticipated. You know, you can sit in the meeting and talk with the tech guys and they're talking jumbotrons and bringing in staging and the lights and all of that. But when you see it happen, it's like, wow, we did that here in San Bernardino. <laughs> so we're going to do it again. Oh, I love it. <laughs> yeah, we're going to do it again. There's going to be amazing music. So it's America the Beautiful. So audiences should anticipate some patriotic music. We're going to play some marches. Everybody loves a march. And we always do um, the uh, Armed Forces Salute, where you play the various pieces of music that are like anchors away for the Navy and such. And then everyone stands up if they're a member of that branch of the service. And then you sit down for the next one. And it's just marvelous because you just see thousands of people standing up for each one. And that's very touching. Oh, um, we're that. also going to play um, some uh, orchestral music, uh, movie music. We're going to do uh, the Raiders March from Indiana Jones, right? Um, we're going to do some, what else are we going to do? Um, oh, the first year we had in two singers and they were fabulous, but this one young gentleman, Ashley, and I'm going to say his last name wrong. It's like Fa'a Toalia. Okay. Ashley Fa'a Toalia. And if I'm pronouncing it wrong, at least that's how you spell it. So you can look him up. He's just adorable. And he sang some pop pieces. And then he breaks into this opera piece and everybody went nuts. It was so neat. And so for months, we were hearing from members of the community how they loved having opera. I never thought we should put on a full concert of opera. I mean, movie music, Christmas music, yes, for sure. But opera, so we're going to do more than one opera piece for this. Um, including, uh, let's see, we're going to do some Puccini, the Ness and Dorma. That's the one that everybody thinks of when you think of it. Um, the, you know, the, the, I, I'm not going to even try, but that <laughs> opera piece where it goes way up, that's the one <laughs> that okay. everybody knows. 
And we're also going to do, um, you know, operatic version um, of Gershwin's Porgy and Bess. That's an opera as well. We're going to do Summertime from that. Um, we're just going to do some really love Remarkable music. things. Oh, my things God. I'm so Love excited. From Love Traviata, things from Sound of Music. And then, and then, the concert ends with fireworks. So for the fireworks, we're going to be doing, um, you know, Semper Fidelis. Uh, which is a Sousa piece, um, the finale of the 1812 or Overture, which is Tchaikovsky, but everybody knows that. I do not have cannons. It's written for cannons. Uh, the school does not want us shooting cannons. They're building okay. new buildings, so no cannons for them. Um, and then we're going to close it out with Stars and Stripes Forever, more Sousa. So oh, lovely. it's going to be fabulous. Oh, I and can't wait. There's assigned table seating as well as lawn seating which is available and there's room for thousands. Last year we had several thousand. I think this year we're going to have a lot closer to five or six. So it's going to be very fun. There will be lawn seating tickets available at the gate when you get there. And they are just $10 a person and kids 12 and under oh my goodness. free. So $10 a person for, for lawn seating. Yes. that and yes. children are free. Yes. I'm there yeah. for sure. Yeah. And we're going to invite everybody on the block, right? Because that is remarkable. I mean, it's unheard of. It really is. It's part of our commitment to the community. Our We have this beautiful, long mission, but it breaks down to accessibility. The music has to be accessible, right? So you have to be able to understand it. Maestro makes uh, sure of that and his programming makes sure of that. Then you have to be able to afford it. $10 lawn seats are certainly affordable. All of our tickets are inexpensive, but, you know, the lawn seating is, you can't really beat that. And then um, you have to be able to get to it. And so it's right in the center of the area, right, at San Bernardino Valley College at 701 North Mount Vernon, I think. Please yes. don't let that be wrong. Okay? That is that is correct. Do <laughs> you have the address perfectly done? Yes. Great. Great. Well, so, I'm a trustee and I'd probably lose my job if I did it. <laughs> no, you have it right. And so um, we're coming up towards the end of the program, but I want you to tell us really quickly about Movie with the Maestro on August 12th. And also please complete the conversation by telling us, you know, what you look forward to as you look for, as you look at the future alongside San Bernardino Symphony Orchestra. And of course, we're going to have to have Maestro Anthony to come and talk about what's happening in the fall. Yeah, so that'd be wonderful. Um, so in August on the 12th, uh, which is they're always Saturdays and they're always at 730. Uh, we will be doing movies with the maestro every year. We do that again. If you're going, bring your lightsaber because you have to have that puppy out for yes. when we play the uh, Star Wars music. Uh, we're going to play some music from the maestro's favorite movies and maybe from some of the movies that he's conducted. So we do this every year. It's one of our most popular concerts. If you're going to get tickets, please go to the website and get them now. We will sell out. You'll go there now and you'll say, oh, look, there's a few seats available. I can wait. You don't wait. In August, in July, they'll be gone. They, so, they can all get sold during the July concert. <laughs> please share that website address with us so people know where to go to get them. Absolutely. It is www.sanbernardinosymphony.org, not .com, .org. So don't just type in San Bernardino Symphony. We may not be the first thing that comes up. You want to go to sanbernardinosymphony.org and you can um, you can go right to the ticketing and pick up your tickets right there. Uh, we use lovely software and you can choose your own seat for the July concert. You have an option of assigned table seating. I don't know what's going to be left. And um, for the general admission seating, you do not need a seat a ticket for your child who is 12 or under to show up with them and your tickets. And then we'll also be selling lawn seats at the, um, at the door. What is coming up in the future for the symphony? I think a lot of things. Yes, just, I know we only yeah. have a minute left, but just tell us what you're most excited about briefly. Just seeing what's going to happen. Everything's been a surprise since we brought Maestro in in 2019. It has all been a surprise. It has all been exciting. Go to our website and you'll see all of the neat things that we have going on. 
And I think you'll be very excited about what we're offering and about being part of San Bernardino. We contribute what we can to our region's pride of place. And so I hope that you find something that is going to encourage you or inspire you when you go and see our website and the things that we do. Absolutely. And like you said, there's nothing like having that collective experience. It just elevates it. It brings a whole new level of inspiration and fun and um, memories, really. And so thank you so much for everything that you do, Dr. Verisol. I'm so excited to come join and, and listen to the beautiful orchestra very soon. Thank you. We'll be excited to see you. Beautiful. All right. For everybody listening today, don't forget to find us on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Check us out on scbrtalk.com. Upcoming events we have here June 7th, 2023, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., fontanajobs.org, Fontana Fair and Expungement event at the Fontana Chamber of Commerce at the San Bernardino County Public Defender's Office will be on site. For more information, call the Fontana Chamber at 909-822-4433 or email jobs at fontanachamber.org. All right, everybody. The fourth annual Beauty Bubbles and Bites is scheduled for this Thursday, June 8th at the beautiful Pond Oaks venue in Mount Baldy. It's a ladies' night out that features beauty and self-care, signature drink, and tasty bites. It's all to help fund and help local youth in our community to succeed in school and life, specifically fund support childhood literacy, monthly book distributions, and reading corners in Hope Through Housing after school program. You can reach out to Daisy Macias at 909-509-2094 and see if there's still tickets available. June 7th through 9th, we have the Lemon Festival and downtown Upland. It has been an important part of Upland tradition since 1997. You can You can experience the Lemon Idol, uh, vocal contests, food competitions, craft vendors, community organizations, carnival rides, and a lot more. Don't miss my interview with Heidi and Sebastian Collado of H&S Transport, talking about the hard work of their father and family invested into the family-owned company and what they did to get it to where it is today. H&S Transport is a company that is made up of sacrifices and hard work. Heidi and Sebastian are the namesakes and view the company with a lot of inspiration. Next week, we will have Dr. Jill Fabricant, founder, president, and CEO of Vastix Corporation, originally named Neuros Corporation, founded in 2003. Vastix was founded in California to develop and commercialize small molecules into new drugs. These compounds were discovered at the City of Hope Center to treat a number of diseases, including diabetes, atherosclerosis, and natural aging. In 2001, Jill joined O'Melveny Consulting as Director of Emerging Technologies, where she was responsible for assisting emerging companies in their needs for corporate growth. Prior to this, Jill was founding president and CEO of three companies whose technologies ranged from gene transfer and ovulation detection to surface chemistry and modification. Jill worked in research and development, successfully developed prototypes and taking them to market, securing major contracts with Fortune 500 companies, and obtained substantial funding through the National Institutes of Health, where she also served as a study section member. You do not want to miss it. We will see you next week, everybody.